thank you again very much, everyone, for coming. Um, personally, I'm finding this an absolutely fascinating conference. Um, and it's just one great panel after another. And I'm absolutely sure this will be a fantastic panel. It's our panel on the mother industries, where we're going to dig just a little bit deeper into the opportunities outlined this morning so enticingly by Mr. Carbassian. Um, as we all know, Iran has a wealth of natural resources, and I believe it's believed to hold more than 7% of the world's total mineral reserves, which is a stonking figure. Um, so to discuss this, Today, we have with us three experts and three people who will, as I say, give you more detail on the opportunities described this morning. We have Bahram Sobani, who's chairman and chief executive of M Mubaraka Steel, forgive my pronunciation. We have um, Ali Reza Gafuri, head of uh, Nik Nikiko, forgive me, uh, um, the Iran's copper producer. And we have Reza Ashra, Ashra, Ashra forgive me, uh, Semnani from Midco, charged with developing the country's mineral interests, steel and copper. Um, I suppose, uh, well, first of all, I would say we have a brief presentation from two uh, of all of our panelists today. And afterwards, I hope we'll have a lively conversation and we will throw it open to the audience. So I'd, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. Sabani if you could just outline for us a little bit uh, Mubarak steel and the opportunities there, and the challenges. Okay. I'm very interested in the challenges. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, you know that the worst time to have the presentation is just before lunch. Hello, everybody. Uh, I will give you a brief introduction to Iranian steel industries and Mubarak Steel Company as well. Uh, probably you know that uh, the total steel produced in 2015 worldwide is 1.6 billion tons all over the world. 50% of it uh, belong to China. Iran, with 16 million tons, 16.2 million tons of uh, liquid steel production in 2015, was located on 14, according to the ranking done by the World Steel Organization. And uh, as the government has planned to increase the existing capacity from the 16.2 available capacity to 55 million tons by, two to by uh, 2025, which is next 10 years. It is assumed that the location or position of Iran within the total world steel producer becomes less than 10. It's, uh, by, 50, by 2025 would be uh, I think it's number eight or nine among the world steel producers. Uh, at the moment, uh, the crude steel production share of the Iranian companies in Middle East and North Africa, as you can see, is 38.9%. After Iran, it's, uh, the, the next after Iran is uh, Saudi Arabia, is Egypt, sorry. Uh, with 13 point, uh, with 13.3, then South Africa 18.3, then uh, Saudi Arabia 15, other African countries 2.2 million tons, and Middle East uh, companies 12 million tons. So Iran has a share of 38.9% on the MENA region. Steel production techniques are uh, the two famous one is blast furnace BOF, called BFBOF, which the energy comes from iron ore, from uh, coal, cooking coal. And the other technology is the electric arc furnace and direct reduction, which energy comes from natural gas and electricity. Uh, the total 1.6 million tons still produced in the world, 75% uh, is through blast furnace and BOF. But in Iran, is totally different, more than uh, 80% is just electric arc furnace and uh, direct reaction, and only 17% blast furnace. And the reason is very clear. The, we have no good access to the good cooking coal. Instead, we have a lot of natural gas. So the technology of direct reaction and electric arc furnace is the most suitable technology for Iranian steel producers. The market share of steel business in Iran, as you can see in 2015, 
uh, about 4 million tons, which is 25% uh, of the total country production was exported and 75% uh, was distributed locally. And on the right slide, you will see that share of Mubarakay on the export is 35% against 65% which is dis distributed locally. And this difference means that the most of the steel uh, exported from Iran was from Mubarak Steel Company. Uh, here you will see the uh, import of steel through different years versus the uh, export. And if you look at the left side, 2007, we have imported 11.6 million tons of steel, various types of steel to the country, but we exported only 1.5. And uh, going through the years, you'll see on 2014, we almost have been slightly different. We are equal on export and import. We have uh, exported 4 million tons of steel, but against 4.6 million tons, which is imported. That shows that in the next couple of years, Iran will be net exporter of steels. Because the installed capacity at the moment is more than 20 million tons, but the operating capacity is 16.4 million tons. So in the next couple of years, Iran will have more export and probably no import a few tons, few million tons of import. Will be next exporter in a couple of years. Iran advantages in development of iron, uh, iron and steel industries is very clearly iron ore mine, very good and uh, rich iron ore mine, as you can see. Uh, the most of the, the gray part, which is the most of the Iranian iron ore mines have the uh, purity or Fe content of between 50 to 55 percent. You can find very rare cases around the world that you can have such quality iron ore available. <coughs> Uh, but uh, next after the, uh, the first one, the biggest one is the second one, which has 50 to, uh, 40 to 50 percent Fe content. And uh, these are the two major mining zones of Iran, which are located on the center of Iran in Kerman, Yazd, and part of it to the northeast of Iran, to the border of Afghanistan, which is Sangon. So among the steel producers, Mubarak Steel Company is the largest one, which is fully integrated plant from, uh, produce different type of flat products, flat steels from iron ore. So we have complete production line starting from iron ore, then it's pelletizing plant, which changes uh, the iron ore to the pellets, iron, uh, iron oxide pellets. Then we have direct, direct reduction where we reduce the oxide iron to pure iron through the, uh, by the natural gas. And then it is uh, electric arc furnaces when we change the iron, pure iron uh, pellets or the sponge iron to the molten steel. And then slab caster, hot rolling mill, and cold roll mills where the cold roll mill will provide the, the feed to the galvanizing line, tin plates, and pre-painted coils, which is consumed in the construction areas. Uh, Mobile Kiss Company was established in 1991. It, this, is what, this was the first uh, flat steel production line in Iran. It was supplied by Italian company. And then uh, the location is in the center of Iran with very good access to the neighboring uh, provinces, uh, good distribution networks. It's the largest integrated mill or steel works in MENA area with 11 electric arc furnaces. Mubarak is the world largest DRI producer, 12 million ton per year is the capacity of production through uh, 11 Mitrex uh, direct reaction units. And it has the share of 50% uh, in domestic crude steel production. So total production of Mubarak is about uh, 7.8 million ton per year, which is 50% of the domestic production. And uh, Mubarak is a well-known brand, brand of uh, steel production, steel uh, material all over the world, particularly in Europe. Uh, the yellow parts are the uh, operating plants belongs to Mubarak. Okay, it, Mubarak itself is located in Esfahan, then 
We have a Saba plant near to Mubareke, which produce hot gold coils through thin slab process. Uh, then we have Kashan galvanizing line. We have uh, Charmohal galvanizing line, which produce galvanizing uh, material for car body. And Sepidash steel plant, Hormozgan steel plant, which is located in Bandar Abbas, with capac existing capacity of 1.5 million ton per year slab. And then on northeast of Iran, the border of Afghanistan, the, on the mining zone of Sangon, we have uh, 5 million ton iron ore concentration plant and 5 million ton pelletizing plants. These are uh, the major subsidiaries of Mubarake. We have actually 50 companies under Mubarake as subsidiaries when we take 100% share up to 55%. Share there are some holding under Mubarak itself, which is Tukafulat Investing Company or uh, Mithil Company, which has their own subsidiaries itself. But most of these companies are uh, either supporting Mubarak by supplying equipment, material, and services, or taking material and working on the material to supply the finished product to the market. Mubarak has started its production in 1993 by 2.4 million ton was the original capacity, but it's keep growing year by year, and at the moment the existing capacity is uh, 7.6 or 7.8 million tons. This year, uh, 2 million ton will be added to the existing capacity, and uh, at the end of the year we will reach uh, uh, about 10 million tons as production. Uh, as at the moment, we have uh, producing 50% of the total country production. We want to stay on the same level. So if the country reaches 55 million tons, we have planned to have 25 million tons. We have already defined the location, the capacities, the technologies, everything is defined. And uh, along with the progress of the job uh, by the other companies, we will expand our ca capacities. Uh, here's a distribution of the production of steel in Iran. You can see that uh, Mubarak has a share of 50.5% and Khuzestan 24.7%. Aswan steel 16.8% and other small or medium sized steel makers have, have the 8% share. Uh, out of that 4.0 million tons of steel which was exported on, 19, on 2015, 1.8 million ton was supplied from Mubarak as finished material. And you'll, uh, here you see that from 2011, from about 600,000 tons, we have reached 1.8. We tripled on four years. Okay, I will go faster. The domestic sale uh, on 2015 was 65%, domestic 35% on export, but on 2014 we had less export and more domestic sales. MSC export market are mainly, you can see the blue one is Europe, and then 27% in Middle East, 5, on 9.5% on the Far East. Uh, MSC is the recognized as excellence organization in 2015 and has the golden uh, award on EFQM basis. We have the uh, global make award, which means most admired knowledge enterprises for four years continuously. And among 25 companies, uh, Asian companies, Mubarak was uh, good in good uh, places. World Steel Dynamics has evaluated 36 companies, steelmaker companies, as world-class company, and Mubarak was number 10 out of those 36. And this is the balance sheet of the company established on internet everywhere. You will see the net income of Mubarak was uh, 30,000 billion rials, equivalent to almost 1 billion US dollar net profit of Mubarak last year. So. It's a brainstorming question, brainstorming question. Is Mubarak a steel company one of the best investment opportunities in Iran? You will reply the answer after you the lunch. Your answer, I think. Thank okay, you thank very you very much. much. Fascinating, thank you very much. Now,
Ali Reza, if you wouldn't mind explaining Nikiko. Thank you so much, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here and I have this opportunity to explain about more, uh, my, co my uh, companies. And as I can see, there is some phone here and I don't know who is belonging to that. Uh, my company, uh, as I have written here, is National Iranian Copper Industries Company, which is an abbreviation of NISICO, and it's the largest producer of copper in Iran. Uh, as Dr. Kabasyan said in his presentation, uh, Iran uh, is located in Tetian metallogenic belt, and a lot of, uh, let's say, copper index and copper mining index are located in Iran. And one of our strategy is to focusing to ex exploration of these uh, belt, uh, of these <coughs> indexes and to find out the different let's say potential and mineral potential regarding the copper. We are focused on seven, let's say, regime to find out the different copper uh, indexes. Uh, regarding mining potential of copper in Iran, as you can find out in this slide, uh, after Chile, Peru, Mexico, United States, Indonesia, and Poland, Iran has the uh, 21st of, uh, of reserves uh, of uh, uh, of, of course, based on million tons of copper in Iran, and the share of that is the four, uh, is four percent. Uh, who we are? Uh, Iran, the National Iranian Company, uh, the copper company, uh, in 1897, archaeological discovery has started in Kerman area. In 1972, established Kerman copper mine. In 1974, uh, Nisiko has founded, and during the uh, years from 1982 to 1997, different plans of Sar Sheshme, which is the biggest company that we have, are uh, started their operation, concentrator plant, molybdenum plant, refinery casting, and leaching plant. And after that, from 2004 to 2015, the different expansion project has started, and finally, as you can find out in, in the slide, in 2015, Sar Sheshme concentrator expansion phase, which is a big, uh, let's say, project, and of course, Songun concentrator plant, which is another big one, was established and started uh, the operations. And uh, for your information, I should tell you that Nisiko is a private company, and its shares are floated in Tehran stock market, and uh, only 20% of the shareholding belonging to Imidro, which is a state organization. Regarding the other companies like Southern Copper, McMoran, and Codelco, Anglo-American, BHP Billiton, KGHM, and Rio Tinto, uh, we are uh, uh, in the eighth, uh, let's say, ranking, and you can find out the share of us in the slide. Uh, we are operating different mines and, let's say, different uh, um, smelters and refineries around uh, Iran, but they are focused on the central of Iran in Kerman province, and you can find out different mines that we are owned. We are producing copper concentrate, molybdenum concentrate, uh, copper cathode with a grade A plus of LMB, which is a well-known uh, product. Uh, we are producing copper billets, copper wire rod, and copper slab as well. Uh, if uh, we want to uh, have any comparison regarding the mine production, Smelter and refined production, you can find out that we are sixth regarding mine production in a global ranking. We are 19th regarding smelter production, and we are 23th uh, regarding the refined production. Uh, we have sold in 2014 1.4 billion United States dollars, uh, and unfortunately, you can see the uh, trend of that, which is declined from. 2010 to, 2000, uh, to, to uh, 2014, and the main reason was belonging to decreasing of the copper price and, of course, the sanctions. Uh, Nisico has different uh, subsidiaries. The, uh, our subsidiaries right now are located in two regions, in Kerman region and uh, Azerbaijan region, with different complexes. We can find out how big our mine is, bad pictures. In Kerman, we have also, an, uh, let's say, concentrator, smelters, and uh, 
let's say, refinery and casting in Miduk. We have another uh, big mine with concentrator. And uh, one important thing that, uh, that I would like to draw your attention in the, is the reserve that belongs to Nisiko. In Kerman, we have 800 million tons of mineable reserves with a grade of 0.68. And in Miduk, we have 211 mineable reserves with grade of 0.59%. And we are producing different type of, let's say, concentrate during, uh, in this, uh, let's say, uh, uh, factories. Uh, and of course, in Kerman region, in the other smelter plants, you can find out the capacity that we have regarding the smelters. And in Azerbaijan, which is the biggest uh, one uh, of uh, our mine, which is located in the north of Iran, we have also the concentrator plant. In this area, the mineable reserve uh, is approximately 350 million tons with a grade of 0.58, and we are producing 300 thousands of copper concentrate plus some molybdenum concentrate in this regard. Uh, I think this is an important part that I wanted to uh, draw your attention. I, I tried to bring the list of the project that we are following in Nisiko. We have divided them in mine and concentrator. You can find out uh, five uh, different uh, mine and concentrator projects with different capacities. And I wanted to show you that the technology provider has chosen before from West Europe. And in the, let's say, final uh, column, you can find out the invest investment which is re required for this sort of projects. The next slide shows the smelter and refinery plants, uh, of course, expansion projects, which you can find out the capacity of that in such a smelter plant. We are following to produce 280,000 tons of copper anode, and in Khatunabad, which is another smelter, we are uh, trying to establish 120,000 tons of copper. Uh, of anode, uh, copper anode. And uh, of course, the technology provider has chosen in this part. Uh, some environmental uh, projects we, we, uh, we have started. One of them in, is located in uh, Songum, which is a hydrometallurgy plant, which is the newest technology regarding the high pressure leaching. And the technology provider has chosen. It's in the starting point of the project. Uh, two acid plants we are trying to establish in Kerman area and of course, a fertilizer plant as well. Regarding infrastructure, which is a very important issues and raised during the previous sessions, we are trying to bring water from Persian Gulf to the center of Iran for uh, some of these projects, bringing water. And of course, the other uh, integrated, uh, let's say, projects are uh, regarding the uh, water and power also, supplying of them. The total value of existing project that we are following in Nisiko is 3.3 billion euros. But what we are searching for financing or direct investment is in this slide. Uh, you can find out that we are bringing some uh, mining projects here, plus acid project, fertilizer one, and hydrometallurgy plant. The total value uh, of this project is 1.5 billion, and we, had, we have paid in this regard 340 3 uh, million euros. It means that the requirement of Nisiko for investment is uh, 1.2 billion euros. And our approach for financing was to find out rep reputable investor from, uh, from Europe Origin Bank. And we are, of course, our interest is to finding the FDI and project finance or some kind of BOT or BO for financing our projects. As a summary, uh, Nisiko will increase its production capacity to more than double up to 2020 from 200 tons, 200,000 uh, tons of copper cathode to 420,000 tons. And uh, for this reason that we should be alive in the copper market, we are searching for newest technologies. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we are open to start the negotiations with the uh, let's say, world-class uh, companies in this regard. And of course, regarding the, uh, let's say, financing, uh, we are open to receive different models for financing of Nisiko project. Thank you for your attention and time that you have spent for this part. Thank you very much. And the 
the last of our presentations uh, to talk a bit about the private sector and um, how the private and state sectors interact and yeah. the opportunities there. Thank you. Thanks for your patience, ladies and gentlemen. We'll talk a little bit about the issue and some data that will be required for the investment. Promise you no PowerPoint, no slides, we talk together. Historically, and by law, the ownership and management of the mother industries, such as steel, copper, and aluminum, as well as exploitation of large mines, were in the hand of state-owned companies. And although most of the few thousands of mines in Iran are private, but production value has primarily been obtained from the large mine managed by these state-owned companies. A few years ago, the Mining Act was modified according to the Article 44 of the Constitution, which emphasizes on the role of the private sector. The first phase of privatization started by selling a portion of the company's shares to the public. In general, the prime goal of privatization is not just to privatize, but actually let the private sector drive the growth and development of the sector. Private entities are responsible for increasing the share value of the shareholders and sustainable profit. Thus, they need to be competitive. They require high productivity, economical capacity, state-of-the-art technologies, these days high-tech, and minimum energy consumption. Having these industries located near the mine, or maybe near the sea, as the case may be, that will eliminate million tons of material transportation. For each ton of steel, we require four tons of transportation of the material. Vertical integration of the mines and the respective industries avoids risk in price fluctuations like these days, and raw material supply. In addition, the number of employees should not exceed standard levels. This was our strategy at MITCO, and it was proved successful, making MITCO the leading player in the private sector in this industry. MITCO was established in 2008 with 1.5 million direct and indirect shareholders. Over eight years, the market cap grew to more than $1.6 billion. And it now has 22 ongoing projects worth $5 billion. More than half of these projects are commissioned. Projects are including 4.2 million tons of steel production capacity, which means one-fourth of the production of steel of Iran. The production chain starts with exploration mining, mining industries, up to sea products, all in one top mining province. A 50,000 ton capacity of copper cathode production using high tech, which is named tank bioleaching, was established for the first time in the world, eliminating SO2 emission and energy consuming smelters low capital cost, low production cost. This is a new and proven strategy in mining and metal industries implemented by a private holding company, and it can be a model for other foreign or local private investors in this sector. I may add that Iran is rich in the minerals that was pointed out today. You have 70 different minerals. Talking about steel is one of the most consumable elements. We have all the mines required. For steel, we need 15 different minerals. It's not like only iron ore. In addition to that, we have all the energies, gas, top in the world, oil, and coal. Also, with 50 years' experience, we have qualified managers, engineers, and technicians. We are also considering the Market growth, because the forecast is about 40 million tons in 2025, that will be 
our demand, local demand, and by the growing economy that 90 million people will have in 2025, that is the requirement of the country. If you put all that in addition to the regional market, which destruction, war, etc., that would require steel and other metals, if we put all that, it would be very competitive. And if we add the issues that I mentioned of the new projects, I don't think there will be any competitor in this sector for Iran steel and some of the metal industries. Maybe it would be good to point out that it is not only steel, copper, or aluminum we talk about, but there are other metals in the country because of the minerals we have. We have precious uh, metals, titanium, molybdenum, magnesium, rhenium. Also, we need downstream industries, super alloys, which we have not done many so far, and also we do need in the non-metallics, bentonite, dolomite, all the refractors required for the sectors, and also industrial minerals. So that is a unique situation if you do consider also these sort of the non-metallics. So if I can add up that to considering all this mining sector in all aspects, that will create the chances and the opportunities also for Iran and also for European countries to share the opportunities together, because that would require, of course, certain equipment, certain technology, and then if we share it, we can also further increase the profits of the investors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Reza. Um, now, uh, I'd like to sort of kick off the discussion and bearing in mind that I think we're running quite over time. Unfortunately, it'll be a little bit shorter probably than, than we would have liked and I'm sure the audience would have liked. But I'd like to throw a couple of questions out to the panel. And one of the most important questions in my mind is, you have great ambitions, but you're coming out into the market at a time when there's a glut of steel on the global market, when commodity prices are low. We heard a bit from Mr. Karbassian why he thought that wouldn't necessarily be an issue, but I'd be very interested to hear from, from you. I mean, if I'm an investor and I'm thinking to invest, I'm not investing anywhere in mining or steel really at the moment. So why should I be investing in any of your companies right now, given the global situation? Reza, would you like to? Yeah, you know, uh, as I mentioned, the potentials, the mining potentials in Iran is unique. And in particular, the new projects that I mentioned is state of the art. There is not any other competitor in this regard. And the fluctuations of the prices in this sector is for two, three, two, three years. If you review, even now, that's getting better. And some of the companies are export-oriented, some no, it's local. In particular, in steel industry and aluminum industry as well, we have a very good market, local market. As I mentioned, we have to reach to 40 million tons. Now we are producing about 16 million tons. So in reality, the way that we have also designed these projects is creating a potential that there is no competition, although these days, my colleague, they're exporting 4 million tons in such circumstances. Naturally, the situation of Iran because of the sanction and certain economic constraints also has put us in a position, it's comparing even with some years ago, we are now using less steel, that's why we're exporting. Mm -hmm. But if you add up all these potentials together, so it will be in a position that from the price point of view, and also from the quality point of view, and the technologies have obtained, in reality, it is no competition. It is really competitive in comparison with the other suppliers. Baram, what is the incentive for foreign investors in Mubaraka Steel then? Well, uh, let me reply your question in two aspects and then also your last question there. Uh, you know, if your question is referred to the investment on the steel industry worldwide, I would say that if you look at the trend of increase of steel capacity year by year, you will see that's always positive. Comparing to five years ago, the production of steel is increased by more than 25%. And it's foreseen that 1.6 billion tons of steel, which is produced these days, is foreseen to be increased to 2 billion tons in the next four years. So there is market, there is demand, but there is always fluctuation. In 2004, uh, 2015 was the worst period for the steel makers. But 
the worst period for uh, demand and price is the best period for investment. Because when you want to invest on steel, the output will not come to tomorrow or after tomorrow. Yeah. It takes three or four years. So if you invest today, the outcome is the time that maybe it's uh, booming, the price are booming, and we are, you are on the top. And uh, w what are the interests for the foreigner to invest in Iran is because if we consider that 1.6 billion tons will be increased to 2 billion tons in the next five years, okay, where are the best places to invest? Where are the best potential for increase of the capacity? In Iran, as I mentioned in my slide, we have iron ore, good quality iron ore. We have natural gas. We have resources. We have uh, young people, educated workers, skilled workers. We have the know-how for uh, implementation of the plan and operating of the plants. So all that band, we have the raw materials and the ferroalloys. We have refractories. So all, everything is required for steel is available in Iran. So if we assume that the steel total capacity of the world production should be increased, maybe the most uh, suitable place is, in, is Iran. And presumably also, although you have ambitions for export, it's very much, a, it, one hopes, a growing domestic market, because certainly you can't control the global prices when China is just dumping steel around the world at prices that make it uneconomic to well, produce steel. I mean, is, is it the fact that it's largely yeah, a domestic we, market? We have done it. They have done a good export last year. The in, in, uh, export of Iran and steel were increased by 50% mm. last year, which was, was the, fourth, uh, the, the worst period. Yeah. So when we could compete China, the worst condition, yeah. when it's a good condition, good demand, a good price on steel, of course, there would be good opportunities for export of steel. And regarding the exportation, if uh, the figure which is set up by government for the next 10 years is 55 million tons, if we consider it, and growth of the population by the next 10 years, uh, we will reach 10 million population, mm -hmm. 100 million population. And assuming 350 kilos of uh, consumption per capita, which means that it means that we locally need to produce 30, 30 or 35 million tons for domestic consumption. So if we run with uh, 55 million tons or 20 million tons to be exported, it's not a big amount. Okay. Uh, I, I want to just only one uh, extra thing to these uh, items. Of course, uh, all of these items that this gentleman explained are uh, in copper sector the same. But regarding the mining sector, uh, when one, uh, someone wants to invest, uh, especially in the mine, he should know, uh, let's say, the information about the mine. Nobody cannot come and uh, invest, uh, for example, for a watermelon, which is closed. So for such a reason, we have done a lot of exploration. We have, lot, uh, we have done a lot of drilling. Let's say the classification of mining reserve are clear for investors. And we have done a lot of, let's say, investigation in this regard. We have worked on a, on a world-class basis. And the sort of information that we have prepared for this, let's say, mining and uh, concentrator are very uh, clear. Another item that I wanted to add is that regarding the uh, concentrator plant, we have done the basic engineering. We have, we have ordered the line lead item, I mean, line delivery item. And for some, uh, someone who wants to invest on our plant, it's a good opportunity which he can start the job and finish it with a very, very, let's say, restricted time and go to the production. This is one opportunity that our project have regarding the mining sector. What, on, on that front about it, you've done the, the sort of uh, studies on the mines and the potential, but there are other concerns for foreign investors. Like we're, you are not called mother industries for nothing. And the big question about whether that you, know, you, you may be a privatized company, but still the question of the state will have a very close eye on your industries and on your companies. And to what extent do we have to worry about state interference if I'm a foreign investor? Is that a concern? Also the transparency about ultimate ownership, I think, is also a concern we've heard a bit today about the various um, obstacles in terms of due diligence and understanding who owns a company and the financial constraints. What are you doing to reassure people about this? How confident can a foreign investor be that they won't find themselves caught out in some way? Thank you. As uh, I mentioned, at present, you know, for example, we are a private company. We're talking about $5 billion projects, very transparent. 
and also it's 100% private. So when in such circumstances at present, and we have been doing large projects in world scale, in eight years, 22 projects are large, I don't know, concentrate, pelletizing, three seed plants, copper technology worldwide. So there is nothing to worry about. And also, there is not the interference of the government, it's support of the government. For example, in China, is not damping. So what to do? So we should have a tariff in order to protect the local supply. So, and also there are certain regulations and laws that is protecting. If we, for example, we will have the research, the research will be counterpart of the tax. If you have the developments, also that tax will be calculated. For productivity increase, there's also incentives. So in reality, now of course the tendency is toward the private sector. No doubt that it's more efficient, and of course it's more flexible, less bureaucracy, and so decision making is very easy. But no doubt that also the other sectors are continuing. So I do not see any obstacle in this regard, otherwise just the support. And of, well, maybe the key issue is the combination of competitive advantages. That's what we have in Iran. China doesn't have, it's, I don't know, it's 23%, 33%, maybe the grade of the ore that we have over 50 and 60. Half of that is imported. Mm -hmm. Some of the countries in the region, they don't have energy. All the energies, like gas, which is the clean source, and also the minerals, and the potentials and the expertise. So we add up all the competitive advantages, I don't think there will be anything to worry about. All right. Now, I know we're running very over time. We're about half an hour over time. Can I take one question from the audience, John? Yeah. Very mm -hmm. quick, yeah. very quick, and then we must go. One question. One question. Wow. Yeah. It's just there wasn't a question earlier, so. Um, hi. Um, I, my question is actually the exact opposite. Now, we've seen that most countries, they're being, uh, most companies, they're being protected by their government. So, for example, for instance, uh, um, the China metal and companies like that, and you have in the Persian Gulf regions, most companies are actually being protected by the government. I want to know how protective is the Iranian government toward your companies, and what is the long-term strategy of the Iranian government to protect the modern industries? Because my understanding is that's the key issue moving forward because we are seeing that a lot of the companies are actually being protected by their government and that's where their success co is coming from. Good question. Thank you. And if we can keep the answer very brief because we will be kicked off the platform. Okay, maybe. Uh, yeah, uh, you're the protection of the uh, modern companies uh, or modern industries like steel or copper industries in Iran. Uh, is a policy of government, but uh, it's you not know, the uh, setting up a regulation and law is time consuming process in Iran. That's the problem. For example, last year, or beginning of the year, uh, 2015, when the price of steel went down very sharply, and all over the, the world, the countries uh, applied anti dumping law against Chinese or Russian or Ukrainians or they put import taxes or import tariff on the imported steel from those countries. And Iranian government or Iranian Steel Producer Association has informed government that you have to act on this. And they tried to do it, but took uh, almost 10 months to, to be, become a uh, enforcement law. This is the problem, but government, uh, no, nevertheless, government is supporting the modern industries. Okay. And also for the mining, they also they reduce the royalty for the mines. And as I mentioned, there are different factors that at the same time with the NGOs and the associations, you know, we talk to the government, and so far we have been all protecting. So that is why in that circumstance, even the, for the first six months, we didn't have any tariff. And it was going on, but later on, that was the tariff was about maybe 20%. So in that sector also, as I mentioned, for the productivity increase, government is assisting. Right, well, I'm really sorry to have to cut it short, but I'd like to thank our panelists today for a very interesting discussion, and um, rest assured there's a bright future. Thank you, Peggy, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.